So, brethren, we have come now to chapter 12 of the book of Jeremiah, and in the first verse it says, Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you, yet let me talk with you about your judgments. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are those happy who deal so treacherously? Well, you see, in the previous chapter, chapter 11, we read that the men of Anathoth, Jeremiah's birthplace, they threatened to the prophet not to prophesy anymore. They conspired to kill Jeremiah, so God pronounced a judgment against them. Now, if they would persist in their intention to kill the prophet, God was going to exterminate all of them. So when Jeremiah heard that, he was not indifferent, you know. It was his hometown, you know, it was his family, it was his kinsmen. So that is why in chapter 12, he starts with these words, you know. God, you are righteous when I plead with you, but yet let me talk about this judgment. Let me talk of your judgments, these that you have pronounced. Now, why does the way of the wicked prosper, brethren? <laughs> well, we know certainly from Psalm 1 that it seems to be prospering, but we know that their end, that they will just uh, be dry and they'll just be gone like a grass. But anyway, why does the way of the wicked prosper? Well, so apparently... Jeremiah had that brewing in his head for a long time. Now is the time to bring it up. Now, wait a minute, God. You know, one thing about your judgments, I cannot really figure out why it seems that the wicked always prosper. Well, David said that, brethren, over 40 times as well. How many times some of the other men say that in the book of Proverbs? Why does it just seem that people can live wickedly and prosper? But we have got to consider the end. You know, it says in the book of Proverbs that the wisdom is to see the end from the beginning. We need to see the end of the story, not to judge the story halfway through. And wait until it is over. You know better. But now he says, why is that the wicked prosper? You know, why are happy those who deal treacherously. Why those people seem to be really happy and prospering with their Easter and Christmas and Sunday and all their crooked dealings? Well, in the next verse, he comes back to the nation of Israel. Verse 2. You have planted them, yes, they have taken root. They grow, yes, they bear fruit. You are near in their mouth, but far from their mind. Earlier, we have read that God planted Israel, and this is the second time we are reading it. Also, God is near in their mouth and far from their mind. That's a pretty good description of nominal Christians indeed. Verse 3. But you, O Lord, know me. You have seen me, and you have tested my heart toward you. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter, and prepare them for the day of slaughter. Well, you might say it's pretty strong terminology we find here. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter. But that is what happened, brethren, to get the house of Judah out of its land. You had to pull them out like sheep for the slaughter, you know. Then in verse 4, How long will the land mourn and the herbs of every field wither? The beasts and birds are consumed for the wickedness of those who dwell there. Because they say, he will not see our final end. <laughs> you see, the land is mourning and herbs are withering. Well, just look at the pollution that we are enduring in this day and age. We are also, brethren, witnessing the strange weather patterns even now. Weather cycles have gone crazy and the land mourns. Because of the wickedness of them that dwell in the land. So we cannot blame God, you know. God is not up there in the third heaven devising how to torture someone. People are doing all that to themselves. Why do the herbs wither? Why is the land mourning? Well, it cracks and groans and dries and, you know, mildews and hails and storms. Well, because of the wickedness that dwell therein. I want to remind you just that in Romans chapter 1, it says that the whole creation is waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. In other words, the whole creation is eagerly waiting for the first resurrection, brethren, in which the sons and daughters of God will appear. They'll appear being born in God's family. They'll be gods. And of course, 
being gods, they'll be creators as well. They'll be able to, you know, breathe in life into lifeless forms. They'll be able to, one day, with the rest of humanity, after the uh, second resurrection and after the whole plan of God has been uh, fulfilled, the whole humanity, billions and billions of members of the God family, will be able to breathe in life into this lifeless universe. Universe is so lifeless, brethren. <laughs> they will never find any life in it. I mean, I hope you know that. The Bible speaks that there is only one. There is only one place in this universe that is populated by humans, and it's our Earth. There is no life elsewhere. I mean, so many billions of dollars being invested by NASA and other space agencies in the world to find life resulted in uh, nothing. So much wasted money, sadly. If people would only follow the Bible, they would know. No, there is no life anywhere else. Christ died only for us, and we are the only human civilization, the only life that exists in all this vast universe. But God created us with this infinite and marvelous opportunity, if we choose it, of course. He created us to be able to inherit eternal life and become part of his family. <laughs> he didn't create angels with that potential, he created humans with that. And the other word, the other day I just came across that verse in 1 Corinthians, I think that uh, it's, uh, it's the gospel and it's the truth into which even angels would like to, would like, like, like to kind of be acquainted with, but they cannot, obviously. So, it is us, brethren, being prepared now. And we're enduring this wickedness of men and all of these weather patterns and all these end days so that one day, very soon, we'll be able to establish, first of all, the government of God over the earth and secondly, to prepare the earth for the vast billions of humans that are going to come up in the second resurrection. And then they'll have a hundred years, you know, a hundred years uh, period of time to change their minds and repent and turn to God. And also inherit the eternal life. And after that, there comes the inheritance of the whole universe, of all of creation. And then that's why the universe, that's why the whole creation is waiting eagerly for the appearance of the sons of God, because we're going to breathe in life into all of this lifeless, endless space. Now, uh, the beasts and birds are consumed, as it says in this verse 4, dying from lack of water and food and from polluted plants. Because Jeremiah is going to die and not see that stuff happen. God is not going to see or, you know, last end. God is not going to see our last, our last end. We get away with this. That's what humans think. You know, we're going to get away with this. He will not see our final end. You know, that's what people say. When we read that phrase, they say, we cannot help but put about the Laodiceans and the book of Malachi. They say, they say, you say, you say. Like in Malachi, will a man rob God? Yet you say, yet you say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. You say, well, what did we do treacherously with the wife of our youth? You say over and over and over again. How about Laodiceans, brethren? You say, they say, you say, I am rich and increased with goods. You say, I am, you know, not blind. You say. So we are living in this Laodicean age and we see these Laodicean churches. The other, the other, the Sabbath I explained to you, I've come to realize that those who have not even joined any of those churches of God, now their brethren, they're lucky and blessed. They're blessed, very blessed, because these other churches of God are deceiving their members. Not only by not preaching the full truth of God, but they're deceiving their members about their legal status, brethren. They are registered at 501c3. One of you, thank you very much, one of our members, one of you sent me even a, a good TV report about the clergy, a clergy council that is you know, operating in alliance with the state. But in all of these churches of God have registered that they, uh, as charity organizations. And they are now conditioned by the state not to be preaching things that the state would not like to be preached. That's why their messages are lifeless. That's why their preaching is without solid foundation. And of course, they get subsidy from the states. What kind of what kind of relationship is that? But they hide it from their members, brethren. 
So I encouraged all these former members of the Worldwide Church of God who never joined any churches not to join them. And those of or those who might be part of those churches to leave them as soon as possible because they have no idea what they are part of. Their leadership lies to them or hides the truth from them. And we know that truth very well, all, all of us here in Serbia, because we were able to see the materials that we needed to have and submit to the uh, British Embassy when we were requesting a visa for to attend the Feast of Tabernacles, etc., so, uh, you know, Laodiceans say, well, they say all things, they're still keeping, you know, the, the, the commandments of God, but it's their approach to preaching to the truth to everything is Laodicean. So I said to these independent members, if you don't want to join, don't join any of them. If you want to come for services, if you have some need to have services, you can always come among the uh, members of the Continuing Church of God without any pressure, without any condition. But at least we are going to tell you the truth. We're not going to be, lie, to be lying to you about our legal status. We're not going to be lying to you about anything in the Bible. We're going to tell you as it is. Because that's the only way how the true church should operate anyway. So, you know, you say I'm rich and increased with goods. That's what all these Laodicean churches keep saying. And yet they're so blind. They don't know so many things about the prophecies right now. They're so, you know so lukewarm because they're in alliance with the state getting subsidy from the state I mean what kind of treacherous attitude is that as far as verse are concerned you might want to jot down Hosea chapter 4 verse 3 because birds are mentioned here also in verse 4 right the beasts and birds are consumed well here is something about the birds in Hosea chapter 4 verse 3 therefore the land will mourn and everyone who dwells there will waste away with the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Even the fish of the sea will be taken away. Therefore, the land will mourn. And everyone who dwells there will waste away with the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Even the fish of the sea will be taken away. Well, as you know, brethren, the oceans are more and more polluted. I'm horrified to see how many plastic, how much plastic is there in the in the ocean, how many plastic bags, etc., etc. Yes, I'm aware that some of your cities have already banned the the, the the plastic plastic wear. Let's call it that way. I am aware of that, but you know the plastic is so prominent and so present in my country that I really wonder how in the world are we going to get rid of that. But the uh, pollution is getting you know getting more and more, getting worse and worse. And God repeats over and over calamities in the book of amos he also speaks of the drought and how it will and how it is going to affect the land and the animals on it you know verse 5 you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you then how can you contend with horses and if in the land of peace in which you trusted they weird you then how would he how would he do in the floodplain of the Jordan? So God is saying, Jeremiah, if you think you have seen anything yet, you have not seen anything yet. If you are fainting over what you have seen so far, just wait to see what is coming yet. What will happen in the area known for jungle? What will happen when you say nations going into captivity? If you have this trouble in the land of peace, wait until you have to stay in the land of captivity. Verse 6. For even your brothers, the house of your father, even they have dealt treacherously with you. Yes, they have called a multitude after you. Do not believe them, even though they speak smooth words to you. Well, this can, this can well be talking about Christ, brethren. Or in the future, what is going to happen to Judah, the brother of Israel, and multitude of the beast power that is going to come down and devour them. We notice who is going to be called against Israel and Judah, a multitude. So not just one country like Russia or China, or as the Church of God believes, Church of God Seventh-day believes it will be Russia and other churches of Protestant Provenience also believe it will be Russia. Well, that's not true at all. That's not a power of the house of Israel. 
That's not the power that the house of Israel will have to worry about at all. They have called a multitude after you. So do not believe them when they speak. In other words, watch out for those European nations, multitudes, you know. They're saying one king, one thing, but later you're going to find out who they are. Speaking of king and kingdom, well, I don't know, we have the uh, right now the first historical visit of the Spanish prime minister to Serbia. And uh, Spain is one of the rare countries that kind of has close ties to Serbia, does not, does respect the international law, does not support partitioning of the land by violating the international law. And the Spanish kingdom, as you know, and the Spanish king was yesterday invited by the Serbian president to come and visit Serbia. Spain is the fourth country when it comes to uh, population, the fourth country when it comes to size. So it's certainly one of those future parts of the beast. Interesting enough, Spain is a very avid supporter of Serbia joining European Union and a very great supporter of the whole of Balkan, Western Balkans joining the European Union. So, uh, yes, we're going, we're going to see a mighty European state and one day on its head there will be a mighty European leader. Most likely, according to what we can decipher from Daniel chapter 11, Daniel chapter 9, that man will be an aristocratic man, a former German defense minister, Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg. And I've been warning about this man. I've been drawing your attention to him for, for, for some time now, brethren, and I'll, and I'll continue. Regardless of YouTube labeling me as a speech, hate speaker, I'm not a hate speaker at all, not at all. I'm just speaking the truth, whether people like it or not. And the Bible is very clear about the truth. He's called, the Bible calls spade spade, and uh, I don't care what YouTube may be thinking about it. I'm still, however, very thankful that uh, a, uh, uh, I'm very thankful that a, a platform like BitChute is still out there and still allows free speech. Brighton is another platform, but Brighton now has very some specific demands, requirements regarding, relating the uh, quality of of, of the program and bits and, uh, and whatever. So BitChute came as a good, very good platform, as a good rescue in which I'm now able, where I'm able now to post all these things that uh, might be of interest to you and to the others. So uh, multitude, brethren, multitude is going to come after the house of Judah and after the house of Israel indeed. The multitude, you know, do not believe what is this they speak. Uh, you know, watch out for those European nations. They say one thing, but later, you know, you're going to all find out who they are. You're going to be devastated by them. Don't believe that multitude, even though it will be speaking smooth words to you. Then in verse 7, God comes back talking about the house, his house of Israel and his temple. Verse 7, I've forsaken my house. I've left my heritage. I've given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. So God has just taken the hedge of protection like he did with Job and his beloved ones were taken by enemies. Verse 8, my heritage is to me like a lion in the forest. He cries out against me, therefore I have hated it. And there is no more protection in his house. So they cried out against God. Now, when we tell people that the Bible really, what the Bible really teaches, then you see YouTube cries out against me. <laughs> and so does Facebook as well. I mean, for days I'm not able to, to, you know, log in because error, supposed error is there. Well, there is no error. I just mentioned that, uh, censored material that is not hate speech I posted on a free platform. And obviously Facebook doesn't like it, but anyway. And uh, Twitter was kind of when I announced my bit shoot, uh, 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 URL, uh, my bit shoot address, Twitter kind of warned the users that it's a potentially dangerous site. Oh well, oh well. What is dangerous to me is to, you know, not speak the truth in due time and not say what it is and how, how things are. So, uh, they're dangerous, you know, they're dangerous, their community standards certainly do not do not comply with what with, with God's standards anyway. But we'll continue to use the internet better until the prophesied famine of the word. And uh, there will be obviously forces who are against us. They'll be trying to stop our preaching, but uh, I'm sure that God is not going to allow it anyhow. And then once we are stopped, well, then the two witnesses will come up 
in due time, and they'll just continue where we left left off. So in verse 8 we see there is no protection of his house, so they cry out against God, and uh, when we tell the people what the Bible really teaches, they are not going to listen. They're going to cry against God like a lion in the forest. Verse 9, my heritage is to me like a speckled vulture. The vultures all around are against her. Come, assemble, assemble all the beasts of the field. Bring them to devour. Well, when we think how Israel and Judah intermingled, it is hard to tell who is who anymore. You see, like Ephraim, we got mixed. It says, Ephraim who got mixed with the nations, according to Hosea. So the heritage of God, instead of being pure, is like a speckled bird, speckled vulture. It is all mixed. All kinds of people are together. You know, birds that are pure tend to pick on those that are not. So the heritage of God has got so mixed. It is a speckled bird and the other birds are against it. And when the time... For God's heritage to be devoured comes. It is not a beast that is going to do it. It is the beast of the field. Now, of course, in the Armageddon, it is going to be all the heathen's powers gathered. Verse 10. Many rulers have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. Well, how can God blame rulers for that, you know, or pastors if it says, as it says in some translations, you know, these were rulers, in some cases pastors, and how can God blame rulers or pastors for that? Well, they don't teach you God's laws, brethren. They don't teach you how to live. They don't tell you how to have God's reign in due season and God's prosperity and blessings on the country. So God places the blame right there. Many rulers or many pastors so we notice again and again and again, God's nation of Israel, in the end time, has God near their mouth. They have many pastors, many rulers, and they are religious. Many pastors destroy God's vineyard. The land mourns. If they had taught about the land rest laws, if they had you know, taught about crops rotation, if they had thought about tithing and all of God's laws, you know, but they haven't done it. So God says they have made it a desolate wilderness. Verse 11. They have made it desolate. Desolate in mourns to me. The whole land is made desolate because no one takes it to heart. You see, the whole land is made desolate because no one but it takes it to heart. No man is so serious about opening the Bible and searching and seeing what God says and doing what God says. Verse 12. The plunder have come, plunderers in plural have come, on all the desolate heights in the wilderness, for the sword of the Lord shall devour from one end of the land to the other end of the land. No flesh shall have peace. Now we notice that it is always the land of Israel he's talking about, you know, all of the land. But you know, brethren, the Adventists read a chapter like, like this, and they apply it to the world. So they say God is going to wipe out the whole earth and the saints are going to go up in heaven to heaven for a thousand years. When in the world, in the world, you know, in, in the world, did they get all of that? When in the world did they get all of that? When? Well, and how? Well, brethren, most likely they got it from the visions of their prophet S. Ellen White. They certainly didn't get it out of the Bible. Because God says the plunderers will come into the land of Israel and uh, they will devour from one end of the land of Israel to the other end of the land of Israel. No flesh is going to have peace. It will be all over the modern countries of Israel. Verse 13. They have sown wheat but reaped thorns. They have put themselves to pain but do not profit. But be ashamed of your harvest because of the fierce anger of the Lord. You see, the produce will be so small that they're going to be ashamed to even mention what they got from what they put into the ground. Thus says the Lord in verse 14, Against my evil neighbors who touch the inheritance which I have caused my people Israel to inherit, behold, I'll pluck them out of their land and pluck out 
of the house of Judah from uh, pluck out of the house of, pluck out the house of Judah from among them. So now he talks about multitudes. You know the beasts that gather around to devour the land of Israel, the bird of Israel. Now he's talking about what he's going to do. All those to all those evil neighbors round about that are going to be the powers to do it, that touch the inheritance that I caused my people Israel to inherit. Then again, look at what land it is talking about. It is the land of Israel. Very clearly, that's what it says, the land of Israel. So, it was a promised land. The land set aside, the land that was separate, it was saved for Israel. Saved for the house of Israel. So now, those who captured Israel are going to be in captivity, and the Israelites will go with them where they will be taken into captivity, whether are some of the countries around the house of Judah, or whether are the countries where the ten tribes are going to be taken. Well, these countries have touched God's inheritance, and now they're going to be plucked out of their land, as they have done to the house of Israel, and then God is going to pluck out Judah from among them. Verse 15. Then it shall be, after I have plucked them out, that I'll return and have compassion on them, and bring them back, everyone to his heritage, and everyone to his land. Well, you see, this verse does not specify a year in our history. It says God returns, and that is when the ultimate restoration of the Jews in the promised land takes place. Now, there are still many Jews around the world who are not settled in the state of Israel. So don't believe those people, brethren, who put all these millennial scriptures and say that the little land of Judah has already fulfilled them. That is one of the worst plagues when you visit the state of Israel. You know, they're perpetually, perpetually telling you about how they are making desert blossom like a rose, how they're fulfilling all the millennial scriptures. They're, you know, they're not doing such thing, brethren. They are just going to go into the captivity. They're going to go down. And uh, we will have to tell them about it. They're not going to like it for, you know, for it. But notice what God said here in verse 5. In verse 5. He said that it shall be after I have plucked them out that I will return and have compassion on them and bring them back, everyone to his heritage and everyone to his land. But it is after he returns. Verse 6. And it shall be if they will learn carefully the ways of my people to swear by my name as the Lord lives, as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then they shall be established in the minds of my people. Those evil neighbors, if those Syrians and Lebanese, Jordanians and Egyptians in the neighboring and the neighbors to Judah, all the neighbors to Judah are all of these countries, if they learn the way of God's people. That's the point. If they learn the God, the ways of God's people, people, you know, they will be they will be established. So now God's people are going to be repentant of having gone the way of Baalism and have now and uh, they are now going to teach these other nations their religion instead of having let them teach. Uh, their own, their own, their own, or their other, or the other pagan, pagan uh, uh, religions. So now God's people are going to be repentant of having gone, you know, the way of Baalism, and how, and now they're going to teach these other nations their religion instead of having them teach them their pagan religions. So now these people are going to be allowed to diligently learn the way of God's people. We are going to teach them how to swear by God's name. Now, how long can all this happen? Well, if the little country of Judah is all Israel, then you tell me how these evil neighbors are going to be established in the midst of my people. How can they be established and well in the midst of such a small nation as Judah is? 
Well, you see, we can imagine them being well established in the midst of Canada and America and Australia and Sweden and England, etc. Yes, we can easily imagine them being established in the midst of those countries, but how can they ever be in the midst of such a small nation as Judah? So this is another good scripture to mark the house of Israel in, to knock in the head the idea that the whole house of Israel is the little country of Judah. Now, some are not going to obey. You see, everywhere we read in the Bible, everywhere we find that there are some hardcore rebels that are not going to obey. So, ahead of time, we will know what critics are able to rule. So imagine the cities of Gog and Magog and the cities of the Egyptians. We're going to know that they are not going to listen. It'll be hard to make Jews out of them, you know. Well, look what God says. Uh, this, uh, this is verse 17. The, but if you do not obey, God speaks to his people. But if you do not obey, I'll utterly pluck up and destroy the nation, says the Lord. So God is through messing around. He is fed up with that. God is through sh uh, you know, shedding grace and pouring out long suffering and mercy. Everybody in the millennium is going to be forced to know God, whether they like it or not. And if they are going to not obey God, that is the, the end of it, you know, the end of it. He's not going to be tolerating it forever and ever. They're going to be plucked up. And when something is plucked up, as you know, brethren, it withers and it quickly dies. This was chapter 12 of the book of Jeremiah.